Tonight's and class is in memory of Moshiach ben Moshe. The Moshe of passing is tonight. We both have Tema Ruchim in honor of Yitzhak Revich's birthday. Yerav Bracha, Vatzlacha, Begashmius, Uberuchnius, and all whatever is not yet Tova Nirva Nigla, open and clear good, it should be transformed to be open and clear good. Tova Nirva Nigla. Amen. 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 And this week we're living with the blessings of Bilam. Bilam wanted to curse the no, Jewish people, and Hashem transformed the curses to blessings. And the, the blessings He gave us were such incredible blessings that every day we start our day with His blessings. Of all the good things to say, of all the good things to say, uh, we have, we have a, the, the, the um, of all the good things to say. We start off our, our prayers every morning with Matovo Lecha Yaakov. How good, how wonderful are the tents of Yaakov. What's so great about the tents of Yaakov? And why is that the thing that transforms the opposite of blessing to blessing? What's so good about those tents of Yaakov that, that does that? So tonight we're going to learn three different angles, three different perspectives on what those words mean. How those words are about us as Jews to each, towards each other how they're about our relationship to Hashem, and how they're connected to our relationship to Torah. The simple meaning of those words are like this. The way the Jewish people camped was that the entrance of one person's tent faced the back of the next of his neighbor's tent. So no one could see what's going on in the neighbor. Everyone was very modest. No one, no one pried into the neighbor's business, not allowed to look at someone else's private things. It's considered damaging them. So everyone was very careful, everyone was very modest, everyone was kept to their own business, no one pried to anyone else. That's the simple meaning of it. But it also means everyone is, was happy in their own shoes. No one was looking at their neighbors and seeing what their neighbors have and jealous of their neighbors. There's an old Hasidic, uh, sort of a joke, of a parrot's machkan al Vashon. He said, why was Sarah happy with the blessings that she received? What were her blessings? She had a, the, the bread was always fresh, her candle was shining from week to week. Why wasn't she thinking about her neighbor's Mercedes? You know, <laughs> because there was a third blessing. There was a there was a cloud on her tent. She couldn't see what was going on in the neighbors. Uh, so the idea of, of of the of that our tents don't face the entrance of each other means that we're happy in our own shoes. We don't think about what what the what the Johnsons have and we're happy with the Joneses have. We're happy with where where we are. That's the that's the equality of the Jewish people. The glove that fits you fits you well. You feel that you are you're okay where you are. You don't have to have what someone else have, has. They they ask this um, salesman, "How are you so successful in selling things?" You know what he said? He said, "I go over to Yankel, and I say, Yankel, you know Shmerel. You see, do you see Shmerel's car? Do you see Shmerel's house? Do you Shmer, see Shmerel's boat? <laughs> when you want to hear that Shmerel has someone else, something something better than you, you want it. So that's the nature of human beings. So the um, the opposite." When, when we're we are we're happy with where we are, that's what opens the doors of heaven to, and transforms the negative to positive. In some communities, Los Angeles would do well to have one as well. They have this thing called a takana, a wedding of takana. What's a wedding of takana? They don't want everyone to make these weddings that make everyone jealous of that the, of each other. So they make weddings that have rules. You can only make a wedding um, have this amount of flowers and this amount of music and this amount of food, and that way no one feels. Um, uh, jealous because everyone and no one feels they have to outdo the other other person. Some people they they, they want to specifically show that they have more than everyone else. So some people keep the rules. When they keep the rules, they get uh, fringe benefits. The the, the the wedding halls they they honor the takana. Whoever wants the takana wedding, not only you get, not only do you get your money's worth, you get also a bunch of uh, fringe benefits. So this guy was very wealthy. And he made a wedding, a Takana wedding. He made a wedding, very minimal wedding. And someone got up at the wedding, it just happened recently, he said, I want you guys to know that tonight there are three orphans getting married in Israel, 
And the host doesn't want me to say this, but I know that he sponsored these th 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 weddings of three orphans tonight. So on, on the one hand, he doesn't have to show off his, his wealth. On the other hand, he wasn't about him <laughs> wanting to gain, gain some uh, uh, money. He, he, put, he put himself and used his gifts where they're meant to go. Not about showing what uh, other people what he has. So that's the first blessing, the first meaning. That the Jewish people are together and everyone knows they're, they're, they're not jealous of others. There was a, a, a friend of mine told me when he met once uh, this, the, the, the guy has his title as the drunken man of 770. I, I don't know if I should say his name. The drunken man of 770 has this unique title. It, this title has changed hands a couple of times in the generations. But... Uh, it was, it was Shavuos, it was a holiday of Shavuos, and everyone's coming out of the 770, all dressed beautifully, and he is in his own, you know, in his own wallowing in his own throw up and dirty and whatever, and, 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 and he goes over to my friend, he says, Rafi, is El Ashir, who is rich, who is rich? Hmm. Rafi says, Hasanech Bechalko, whoever's happy with what he says. Lo, that's not what it means. <laughs> who is rich? Hasanech Bechalko. Someone was happy with what someone else has. Wow. That's someone who's well, wealthy. So Rafi, my friend Rafi, Rafi Alevi, you know Rafi Alevi, he shared this yeah. with Mordechai Eliyahu. And Mordechai Eliyahu said, this is the depth of the Mishnah. This is a real deep meaning. Not just happy with what you have. You're happy with someone else has. Ah, what a marriage. You're never going to be happy outdoing another person. Because if you outdo one person, it continues. It continues. And then it stops. So this, now I want to share with you a second interpretation of those words. Hmm. This interpretation is from Rav Baruch Medjabusher. If you pronounce that correctly, you, you, you may retain your American passport. But there's another teaching. The same teaching was also echoed by Rav Simcha Buna Pshishch. You say that, you're going straight back to Mexico tonight. Anyways, Simcha Buna Pshishch. Simcha Buna Pshishch and Rav Baruch Medjabusher said a different explanation. Unbelievable explanation. They said this. What's the meaning? What's the meaning of their entrances weren't facing each other? He says, not talking about Jews and Jews, talking about Jews and Hashem. That Hashem doesn't respond to us commensurate to what we do. We invest in our relationship with Hashem, we give to Hashem, and Hashem responds to us disproportionately, not as much as we put in. As the Talmud says, Hashem says, open up for me like the opening of a needle, and I'll open up for you like the opening of the ulam, the opening of the huge entrance to the temple. In the second section of the temple, there was a big door. It was about 40 cubits wide, uh, 40 feet wide, 80 feet wide. And that, that if you open like a needle, Hashem says, I'll give you so much more. Why a needle? Why the entrance of the, of, the, of the ulam? You could have said, give Hashem a drop of water, and Hashem will give you the ocean. Why, why do you want, what is the example of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the opening of a needle? So, one, one explanation is like this. The needle, what's the difference between, God forbid, getting hit in the head or getting pricked by a needle? Or hit, you get many different ways, God forbid, to, to, to get injured. But when you get pricked with a needle, it penetrates and it, and it shakes you up completely inside of you. It, it touch, it, it, your whole being is shaken by, by, by being pricked by, with a needle. Because your nerves. Right. So the Pesim Chabonim said that when Hashem tells, him, tells us to open up like an eye of a needle, what that means is that maybe we're doing something which is very small, but we're doing it all the way. Some of you may know Uri Zohar, who made a very dramatic steps in his, in his Judaism. How did his dramatic steps in Judaism, in Judaism start? He decided he's going to do one mitzvah. But he's going to do this mitzvah, Adaso, all the way. What was the mitzvah? The mitzvah was going to light Shabbos candles. But his wife didn't want to light Shabbos candles. So he lit Shabbos candles. But he's going to light Shabbos And Adaso, he went all the way. And he wasn't a very um, good yeshiva student. And he decided to, he's going to spend his time um, protecting the neighborhood. So they had the Camp Crown Heights started at the time, Shmira, patrols around the neighborhood. He joined the patrols around the neighborhood. We got bored of that too. So he thought the next stage is getting married. He should get married. So he had an audience with the Rebbe. He was going to ask the Rebbe this question. Is it time for him to get married? And the Rebbe told him, it's not yet time for you to get married. The Rebbe told, very um, gently told him, it's, it's not yet time for that. You're not ready for that yet. But the Rebbe said, that you should continue your work in controlling the neighborhood in Shmira, and you should also spend time studying Torah. How much time? Five very oh, you remember very specific. Five minutes learning the written Torah, five minutes learning the oral Torah. The written Torah, the Rebbe says, you should learn the Torah portion of the week, and the oral Torah, 
You should learn whatever you want to learn, but you can only learn for five minutes. That's it. And if you want to add, not more than 20%. Meaning, not more than one more minute. You can add, you can add six minutes if you want. So he started learning, and he goes, wow, this is so interesting. This is so interesting. <laughs> and never said, you, you should be, like, you should, those five minutes should be, you're comfortable. After you've eaten, and you've drunk, and you slept, just enjoy. Just sit down for five minutes, and just enjoy. And he did that, and he said, it's so interesting. It was Parshas Vayir, I think, when he first started learning Kumish. And he was like, wow, I want to continue. I can't continue. I'm not allowed to continue. It's against the rules. So he asked the Rebbe, can I continue learning? They allowed him to continue learning. And he never stopped. And he used to continue learning more and more and more. And what did everyone accomplish? He learned for five minutes. They want to accomplish that the needle all the way, all the way. Because when you open up to Hashem, like the eye of a needle, Hashem opens up for you so much more. But how does Hashem open up for us? Says the Talmud, like the opening of the Ulam. Why the opening of the Ulam? So the Ulam, this entrance. It was, when you walked in the base of Migdash, you first went into the Azar, the courtyard, then you went further in, and there was a holier place, a higher level of holiness called called the Heichal. You got in the Heichal, there was this big opening. What you know, we know about this opening was that it was 40 Amot. 40 Amot, is, the number 40 is very significant. <coughs> what do we know about the number 40? Every time we find the number 40 throughout Judaism, we are 40 years in the desert. There are 40 days of the flood. There are 40, uh, uh, the 40 measurements of water in the Mikvah. There's uh, Moshe Rabbeinu was in the Mount Sinai for 40 days. There are 10 <coughs> spheres in every world, and there are four worlds, there are 40 spheres. So there's always number 40. The Maharal of Prague says, why number 40? And it, a baby's gestation period, the Talmud says also 40 days before a baby is born. The 40 days of conception is about a new world, a new beginning, a whole, whole, whole transformation. So Hashem says, you make a, you open up for me a little bit. You think it's a tiny little thing. It's just one little mitzvah. What's the big deal? And why should, why, if I do it or if I don't, it doesn't matter. But Hashem says, you do this. You hold on to it. You, and you open up like the eye of a needle, a tiny little thing. But Hashem says, I'm going to open up a new world for you. It's going to cause in you a whole transformation and new opportunities, physical, material opportunities, financial opportunities, spiritual opportunities. Just open up a little bit. Take, take something and, and hold on to it. Hold on to something and go all the way. Don't, not just, not to tell you, not to tell you, is it a big thing? In fact, if it's a big thing, it's probably not some coming from your good, your neshama because it's trying to confuse you. But take something and, and then you go all the way. Some opens up so much more. So much more will open up for you. And that's also the meaning of the needle. The Rebbe says, what's the even needle? A needle is used to thread a garment. We are in the physical world and we have physical desires and we're all surrounded by the physical, 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 physical. The even needle is to puncture the physical, to puncture our ego, to give up things that we're used to, things we're not comfortable with. A little bit, you would give Tashman a tiny bit, and what happens is a thread, a thread from the spiritual, from the holiness of Hashem, enters the world through you giving a little bit. You give a little bit, and you cause a, a little bit of holiness come to the world. Why does Hashem give us such a response? Why is He so excited about it? Why is it such a response? Where, where does it come from? Because the Alter Rebbe says, Hashem, in the time of the exile, is like a person who's lost in the desert, and he's very thirsty, and he wants to drink something, and there's not much to drink, and finally, finally, he finds a drop. So imagine, you're in your house, and you're saying, Ani. You, you're saying, Ani in your house, and in the whole world, how many children are saying, Ani? Not as many children as there are, there are billions of people in the world. And you're one of the few millions of people that say, Ani, of all the billions of people in the world. So Hashem, you know this for Hashem? Hashem takes the Maida Ani, it's like diamonds for Hashem. It's like a diamond. He takes every word for Hashem. It's like a diamond. He takes the words and he plays with them and he enjoys them. He has pleasure from the Maida Ani. It's, 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 it's such a gift for him. And therefore, Hashem responds to the Maida Ani that you say the little things that each of us gives to Hashem with such a overwhelming response. So that's one thing about the opening of the Ulam. And there's another text of the Talmud in the Medrash which says this. Hashem opens up for us, not like the Ulam, but like the opening of streets that can have caravans going through them. That means, not just one opening Hashem gives us. He gives us many, many opportunities to open up for us in our lives. When we give to Hashem something, we give it ad asof, but all the way. Now, that's, that's ex- the second explanation. I've had the two explanations. Number one, it's about us to each other, right? That we're, that we're not looking at each other, what each other has, but we're happy where we are. Second interpretation is, 
Hashem's opening to us is, is disproportionate to what we open to Hashem. By the way, the ulam didn't have doors. Hashem said, I'm opening you wide. There's no doors to the ulam. Hashem, I'm going to give you all the way. So that's the second interpretation. Yeah, you ever follow for, for the first two? Yes? No questions? We're good? We're going to Nigan Vaiter, we're going to third interpretation. You ready for the interpretation? Nigan? Third interpretation. Third interpretation. Third interpretation is like this. It's about us and our relationship to Torah. Our relationship to, to Hashem's the mitzvahs that we do. Not about our financial welfare, not about how Hashem responds to us, but about our own path and mitzvahs. One thing, every person in our life, in our generation, is a generation of Mashiach. We have all that in common. And all of us are blessed to live in the time of, of the revelation of Chassidus. Hashem gave the Jewish people the soul of Torah. And yet, in this generation of the coming of Mashiach, each of us is different. That Rizal said that when you went into the base of Migdash, there were 12 different entrances, 12 different ways to go in. And each tribe went in different entrance. Mm-hmm. What if, what if you didn't know what tribe you were from? So that Rizal made a, a, said that there's a 13th gate in the base of Migdash. And so too, when we pray, there's Svar, there's Ashkenaz, there's Nusach Italia, there's all kinds of different versions of prayer. And Arizal said his version of prayer is for every Nisham, every soul can use his version. But we all have different ways of keeping to our mitzvah. We all have our own way. And you don't think that your way has to be the same as someone else's way. Everyone has their own thing. I have a great blessing. They lose things very often. <laughs> I consider it a very great blessing because it says in Gemara that it, you are atoned for any sin by just not any sin. You're, you, you receive atonement. If you put your hand in your pocket, you can't find something, boom, you're getting cleansed. So I got it's an easy way of getting cleansed because if you find it later, so you only lost only a few minutes of anxiety and you get, you get it back. I'm I'm very happy with this method of as opposed to other methods of being cleansed. Anyways, so I don't know if you guys are watching um, the flights as I was this week. My taking my, my children went Baruch Hashem different places for camp, and I went to the LAX more times than I can count because many flights were canceled. So in my journeys to LAX, um, I parked in Tom Bradley yesterday, the international flight. And as I'm very good at losing my car, but this time, since I'm good at losing my car, I, I try to make sure to have signed kinds of signs and write down and no and whatever. But yesterday I decided this is a perfect park. There's no better parking spot in the whole the whole floor. This is this is the best parking spot. I don't have to remember. I mean, I, I can't miss it. This is right by, right by the exit. I mean, this is this doesn't get better than this. I will remember this parking spot. I will remember that I had such a great parking spot tomorrow because such a great parking spot. Anyways, but sure enough, I come back to the parking spot. And you know, 3B, 3C, 3D, it's nowhere. The length and the breadth and depth of the, of, of, the, of, the, of floor number three, it ain't there. And you know, in my journeys trying to find my car, um, I've had many different experiences, but this is the first time that I also encountered another person who's also looking for their car. This is, and so the other person, I said, uh, they said they, they left their car on 4B. I said, so why are you looking at 3B for because I can't find it on 4B. And then we both realized there must be more than one 4B. There must be more than 3B. And there's tr- tr- turns out there's two parking structures. We're both in the wrong one. And Baruch Hashem, uh, Baruch Hashem we, found, we found the right way. <laughs> not, that, not that person. Not that person. It's like the story about the guy who went to the bridge and he went to find the treasure. And he said, look at the treasure in somebody's house. And he said, you Hashem gives each person their mitzvah they need to do, and everyone has a different role. And the idea of not being, being, uh, not being look, looking at another person's opening means you realize that Hashem is watching you and is guiding you to the mitzvah you need to do. The true story, you're not going to believe it, but it's a true story. The gentleman is driving in the Alps. He's driving in the Alps in a way that his, his car is hugging the, uh, the mountain, you know, it's between the mountain and the cliff. And all of a sudden... He hears this beep, so he stops the car. And he stopped the car by, by, by a turn. And when he stopped the car, this, uh, this bus was, he was like closer to the mountain. The bus was halfway in the middle of the, uh, of the, of the lane. And so the bus just moved around him, and, and everything was fine. And had he not stopped, he knows for sure he wouldn't be alive. For sure he wouldn't be here. But then he was thinking, where did the beep come from? It wasn't from the bus. It wasn't from his car. There were no other cars around. Where did the beep come from? He stopped his car, like just like clocked, clocked himself. He realized, like, you know, God just saved his life. Where did the beep come from? And he realized he was watching a Torah class, or he was listening to a Torah class, and someone in the Torah class in the background had beeped. 
<laughs> so he heard the beep in the Torah class, and that's what made him stop the car. Imagine, Hashem arranged that the guy gave a Torah class five years ago. And in the middle of the Torah class, someone's beeping. And he hears the beep, and that's, that's, that's what he had to hear that exact moment. In Kfar Chavad, where my Grevich is uh, from, there was a boy studying in the yeshiva there who was having a very hard time. He was having a very hard time because he said, I'm stuck with this Judaism, I have to keep it, I don't like it, I'm, I have no choice, I'm Geza, I was born with it, I, can't, I, 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 I don't like it. And he was crying by the Fabreng, and Mendel Futafas was Fabrenging, the legendary Chassid, and the Mendel, he tells her, Mendel, what's bothering you? He says, I'm bothering me, I have these friends, they love it, they're excited about it, they learn, they enjoy it. I'm not the guy, I'm not the guy. It's, for me, it's so hard, and for them it just flows, just flows. So Mendel took out a bottle of Coke and he poured it into a cup. And Mendel said, what's, the, what's better, the bottle or the cup? the cup? What has more, the bottle or the cup? So he said, the bottle. So Mendel said, okay, so what's the advantage that the cup has that the bottle doesn't have? I don't know. The ring continued a little bit. Mendel went, you figured it out, the advantage the cup has over the bottle? <laughs> yes. The advantage that the cup has... And the cup is full. The cup is full. What does Hashem want? Does Hashem want more? Or does Hashem want full? full? Hashem wants full. Hashem doesn't want more. So, Hashem guides each of us different paths, different mitzvahs. Today, I don't, in my, I don't know what number journey was to LX this week. I went to LX again today. And uh, I, I was... Because a lot of flights in New York were canceled because of the weather in New York. Right. So I went to New York. So anyway, so Baruch Hashem finally got, I got my child on a flight today. And I went to LAX again, and there's a gentleman there. Okay, yes, people went on film. That was that was great. That was that was how they gained. But I'm talking about how I personally gained from my trip to LAX today. I, I um, meet this guy who is here to do hashgacha for the Volava Hachshar. We have the Volava Hachshar. He goes, "Oh, you okay? This is Volava." And he says, "Tell me the following story of the Rebbe." He says this gentleman named, named Mr. Bernstein had a school. And, it was, and he's, he's considering he should keep the school, he should, shouldn't keep the school. And the Rebbe says, uh, it's worth having a school for just one child. Like, wow. Did you tell you this randomly? Yeah. yeah actually, he had a reason why. He wanted to tell him because his family was from... It's a long story, but the, the story continues. But, the, but that part of the story was, uh, was... I need to tell that story today. I need to tell that story today. Yesterday, I was by a wedding, and Rabbi Block was at the wedding. Yeah. Rabbi Block, I said, Rabbi Block, you have a connection to Lubavitch. Tell me a connection to Lubavitch. Oh, I'll tell you about my connection to Lubavitch. My grandfather, he came to America, and he, and he was doing very well financially in, in the garment industry. And then all of a sudden, he taught the kid for bar mitzvah lessons. And he, the kid didn't, was, had some, some learning challenges. And he was learning and learning with this kid, and he successfully was able to get this kid to, to learn. So, so he was thinking he should stop his garment industry and go into teaching children. And he asked the Rebbe, he wasn't a chassid, I mean, his father was a chassid, but he wasn't, in America, there was no Chabad yet at the time. So he went to other yeshivas, and so he asked the Rebbe anyways, because, you know, there was, there, was a, there was some connection, some, of course, absolute faith in the Rebbe's words. He asked the Rebbe, should I stop working in the garment industry, or should I, and teach? The Rebbe said, yes, you should go and teach, and because he didn't have the opportunity to, to, to study Torah during World War II, he said, you're going to teach children to study Torah yourself. And so he started a school for special needs children in, in New York. And it's called today, you Google, the Block Institute. It's a $11 million campus, uh, 800 children. It's, it's a, that, that all started because the Rebbe said, and this is the direction you should go. And anyways, the point is, what No, it was very successful. The point is, we say every day in davening, the God of Avraham, the God of Yitzchak, the God of Yaakov. Why don't we say the God of Av, Yitzchak, and Yaakov? Why do we say separately the God of Avram, the God of Yitzchak, the God of Yaakov? The reason is, huh? Each of them is very simple. Because the way to know Hashem is at Yodati. Each of us knows Hashem by our own experiences. And not only do we know Hashem by our own experiences, Rabbi Nachman says you can't convey tomorrow from today. You can't know Hashem tomorrow the way you know Hashem today. Every person knows Hashem through their own experiences, through their own things that are going on in their life. And that's like, are we prant film? Are we have an armed villain? We have head villain. Armed villain is one long parchment. The head villain is four compartments, separate compartments. It comes to our practical, we do the armed villain, it's all the same. It comes to how we think and how we feel and how we approach. Everyone's different. And Hashem guides each of us to connect to Him in the midst we need to do, in the places we need to go, in the way we need to connect to Hashem. It's very specific. And Lachaim, 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 Lacha
Removing that disturbance, begashmus, beruchnius, and should go grow exponentially in the shlichus Hashem has for each of us, and should see tonight the actual coming of Bias and Mashiach in Shlaim and Akedish, a Hara Kedish, take me a mamish, a Chaim, a Chaim, a Rav.